How's everybody doing today? I want to thank everybody for joining us today for our webinar on laminitis. I'm Corbin Delaney. I'm the marketing manager here at Life Data, uh, and I'm sitting here with our presenter, Mike Barker. And then today we also have a special guest, professional farrier, Darren Owen. So we're really happy to have him on with us as well. And again, I just want to thank everybody for attending today. Um, so today, uh, laminitis is a pretty uh, complicated subject, and we're going to try to get through this within 45 minutes. Um, but if we do end up going over, we hope that everybody can stay on with us. Uh, we're going to try to uh, touch everything that we can, and we're going to try to answer any questions. Uh, so at the end of the webinar, we're going to have a little time frame where we can answer some questions. Uh, so keep those in mind, and when the time comes, please uh, feel free to submit those questions. Um, and then we're also going to be doing a giveaway today. We're going to be giving away a, a bag of the Fairies Formula Double Strength, as well as a, a bag of a brand new supplement that we're going to uh, talk about today. Uh, so that's pretty exciting for us, and uh, we hope that you guys have a good luck uh, during the contest and uh, that you guys um, enjoy the uh, presentation. Uh, so I'm going to turn it now over to Mike Barker. Thank you, Corbin. And we would certainly like to thank each of you for taking the time to. Uh, uh, be with us uh, during this particular lemon, lemon, uh, uh, webinar. Of course, we're going to talk about uh, a subject that uh, I'm sure a lot of you have encountered, especially if you if you have horses or have been around horses. And we also have with us a very special guest, and he is a professional farrier out of Scottsville, Virginia, uh, Mr. Darren Owens. And I've been knowing Darren for several years now. Uh, he has agreed to come on and give us some of his uh, comments, his insight when, as we talk about this uh, particular condition uh, that, that affects many, many horses across the U.S. and around the world itself. And as we get into the, uh, the, the webinar this morning, uh, we need to understand exactly the magnitude of this particular problem itself. In fact, in 2018, the American Horse Council estimated the horse population to be somewhere around 7.2, 7.5 million horses in the U.S. It was also estimated that approximately 15% of that population would be touch affected uh, by this, this particular problem, laminitis. Uh, to put that into perspective, that means that one out of every seven horses is going to be touched with the condition, or uh, out of that total number, we're looking at over a million horses uh, on an annual basis that's going to have a bout with laminitis or a continuous problem with laminitis itself. Let's talk, uh, spend just a few minutes talking about what laminitis is. And the one thing that we need to keep in mind is that this particular condition or problem is actually caused by another issue that the horse has experienced. And we're gonna talk about some of these conditions that triggers this particular problem, laminitis. Of course, we know, number one, that it's going to affect the horse, specifically the foot of the horse, the hoof capsule. We know that it is a very painful uh, condition in itself. And, and what we have that comes into play is the lamina uh, is affected. We have uh, swelling within the hoof capsule. Uh, and, and we'll talk about the lamina in a little more detail as we get into the program itself. Of course, uh, laminitis can, and most of the horses that will uh, suffer about of laminitis will be lame. Uh, if we don't jump on the problem quick enough, then it can be fatal. Uh, and then keep in mind too that once a horse has had a laminitic bout, it's going to be always subject to the same problem in the future if we don't do a good job at preventing the problem itself. Uh, and, and I'm gonna ask our, our guest speaker, uh, Darren, how, how does the horse owner know that 
they they actually have a problem with laminitis. Well, Mr. Barker, first, thank you very much, and those attending, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you about a subject that is that is so uh, so important to us as as horse owners, and we hope uh, everyone is well and safe uh, at at this point. Uh, when we think about our horses and we think about the symptoms that would be displayed, um, we know that laminitis causes discomfort and pain. Uh, that is one of the first symptoms that we're going to see uh, in the horse is going to be the discomfort and or pain. This will lead to the horse actually having a reluctance to move. So, for example, if your horse is uh, obviously in the pasture and it's time for them to come up to the stable, or it's time for riding exercise, and, and this horse is a horse that normally is at the gate waiting and, and is not, uh, that would be a clue right then that, that the horse, that the change in the horse's behavior and the reluctance to, to do its normal movement, travel, come to the gate, walk to the stable, uh, greet you when, you when you go out, et cetera. Uh, as this progresses, you'll begin to see the horse redistribute the weight um, of the horse being truly an ungulate by definition. It only has four places to to actual uh, distribute that weight in the four limbs standing on one one particular finger if you will one bone uh, it will then begin to try to put the weight to the back uh, you'll start to see the the classic triangulation of the horse where the horse is putting weight to the to the hind legs and using the very strong muscles in the rear of the horse is essentially a, a hammock or sling to, to support the weight uh, further examination you'll then pick up a uh, evidence of a digital pulse in the lower limb down around in the some will, will find it uh, in the back of the actual pastern and then others can find it down lower almost uh, almost to the actual hoof capsule itself down in the back as if you uh, uh, is, is taken on a on a human being uh, the evidence of that that digital pulse building uh, simply is, is a result of compartment syndrome where we now are starting to have uh, a buildup of, of discomfort and an inflammation in the in the lamellar beds of the hoof capsule, uh, and certainly that's going to be associated with with warmth and heat upon examination in the hoof capsule as well, sir. Thank you, Darren. Uh, and as we mentioned earlier, uh, we, we were talking about lamina and the the purpose or the function of the lamina itself. It, it's the attachment mechanism that's going to actually attach the hoof wall and the sole of the foot to the coffin bone itself. And during this laminitic process, the blood supply is being compromised, oxygen is being compromised to the lamina. And as this blood flow is being compromised, then this lamina is going to want to die and to give away. So that, that's essentially what's going on there. Uh, and, and, you know, there's a couple of types of uh, laminitis, and, and we'll ask Darren to come back on and to talk about this as well. Yes, there, there we, we think about this. We think about an acute laminitic event uh, often may be the only time that this horse would, would have. Uh, and so this is why you, when you look at the screen, it's divided in acute and chronic. Um, the acute, it would be the, the when you are going to, when you see the horse presenting with, with the discomfort that we, the symptomatic issues we talked about before, um, and they're going to be, they're going to come on the horse rather, rather quickly, um, and they're going to be severe in nature, um, and you're going to, to see things presented as we talked about, the, the restructuring of the weight, uh, how the horse is standing. Um, as this, this progresses and the pain continues, uh, we know that laminitis, uh, obviously, there's a significant amount of pain in the dorsal aspect or, or front portion of the hoof. And so you'll see horses starting again redistribute by using their heels to walk on uh, when they when they come to you. And they're also pr protecting the actual apex of their distal phalanx or coffin bone when they do that, because that front portion of the foot is very, very sore and they'll walk on their heels. That's the most comfortable portion of the of the, the foot at that particular time. Uh, this certainly is going to lead can lead to short-term lameness, uh, and it, and it, and hopefully you you we in the any laminitic situation we're going to get the veterinarian farrier team on. Uh, we'll discuss that as we go further into the to the webinar, 
Uh, and then we have, we have our chronic laminitic, and these unfortunately are horses that uh, may have a, a much deeper uh, reason for being laminitic, uh, and they're going to suffer laminitic upsets, if we'll call them, uh, conditions uh, throughout their lifetime. From that, you're going to see uh, more more advanced problems, uh, and you're going to see the actual hoof capsule itself being uh, starting. Uh, showing signs of deformation because there is some change in the bone inside extensile. You'll see the white line widening out as you see illustrated on your screen. And you're going to see things that are going to be a uh, remnant of, of a horse that is suffering with chronic laminitis because this condition continues uh, to, to be difficult for the horse as he's going, going along. And Darren, as, as I travel about and talk to horse owners at these different horse expos and horse fairs, a lot of times that horse owner will actually make the statement that their horse has foundered. How do we know that a horse is actually foundered? Well, that's, uh, that's going to be determined by the, the treatment team. That's going to be determined uh, by the, the equine practitioners, the veterinarian farriers alike. The farrier will uh, certainly see evidence on, on the solar region of the foot, especially in the, um, in the, the horse that is, is suffering uh, for a period of time where the hoof capsule begins to change. And you'll see the stretching in, in the toe. You'll see the the, the in the front of the foot, you'll see the stretching of the lamina, et cetera. But truly how it's gonna be be defined, you'll see growth rings, et cetera, that we talked about, the exaggerated growth rings in the heel where the, the front of the foot's not growing, dorsal wall is not growing properly. But truly it needs to be diagnosed by, by the help of a veterinarian, and that would be radiographs. The veterinarian would assist us in, in the, the treatment uh, in the sense of shooting or taking radiographs of the horse to be able to actual look at the inside of the horse's foot to determine the alignment and the position of the coffin bone inside. And the founder term comes in when there's true diagnostic uh, imaging that determines there's been a movement of the coffin bone. And that, that term founder originated from a nautical term uh, and was named uh, because of the, the essentially that coffin bone at this point as it's going through this condition and state is foundering with inside the capsule itself. A nautical term for ships foundering at sea in a bad storm. So as we see on our screen now with top left picture you can see uh, when you look at the front of the coffin bone you can see an alignment that appears to be parallel with the front of the actual dorsal wall the front or dorsal wall of the hoof. Uh, you see nice sole depth, sole depth there measured uh, I believe it's 21 millimeters and you see the things look uh, relatively what we would call relatively normal in that particular picture. Um, and then if you look at the other two images, especially the one right below that, you'll see uh, distortion. You'll see that the, the toe is now distorted outward. And one of the interesting things that this film brings us that we couldn't see any other way is, uh, is if you look at the very tip of the coffin bone, you'll see where the lamina has been torn in, in the very front of the foot, and you see these gas pockets. Uh, and what that is, that is an abscess tract that has migrated from the front of the horse's foot up through the lamina, under the sole, and to the actual tip of the coffin bone. Abscesses are common tornadoes within the hurricane or the laminitic storm, if you will, and you'll see those in the radiographs. Again, only, only detected uh, and, and be, by a radiograph to be able to see the true entirety of the abscess. And then on the right, that's a picture of, of a actual uh, horse's foot that is suffering from a uh, has suffered from a chronic, lifelong uh, laminitic events, and you you can actually see where the the toe is distorted, and you can see some remodeling in the coffin bone, where the coffin bone is begin to beginning to remodel due to the stresses that's put upon it as the horse is, uh, deals with this condition through a, a very long lifespan. As we take a look at the effects of laminitis on the hoof itself, of course, uh, this can involve only one foot, uh, a couple of feet, or uh, the horse can actually have a, a laminated bout in all four feet at one particular time. Most of the time, the condition is going to be in the front feet uh, simply because uh, the horse carries about 60% of its weight on the front feet itself. 
course, uh, during this laminitic process, we have this disruption of blood flow to the lamina, which is the attachment mechanism. Uh, and, and this disruption of blood flow comes about because of the inflammation, the swelling that's it within the capsule itself. And, and of course, uh, the important thing to keep in mind as far as blood flow is that the blood is carrying oxygen number one. Uh, it's also carrying the nutrients uh, that the, laminitic, the lamina needs to survive and to replenish. Uh, and if we don't uh, deal with this in a, a timely fashion, then the lamina is going to die and become weakened. Uh, and worst case scenario is that the uh, coffin bone can actually rotate or drop through the sole of the foot. And when we, and if that actually happens or if we have rotation, uh, of course, if, if the coffin bone actually rotates through the sole of the foot, a lot of times these horses are going to have to be euthanized. Uh, but if we, if that doesn't happen, then, and if we do have movement of the coffin bone, then this, this is irreversible there. The damage has been done, and then we've got to live with that condition for the rest of the uh, life of the horse itself. Uh, and as we, let's talk about some causes. What causes this particular condition in the horse? And, and as we take a look at these here, uh, there's many causes. And I'll also ask Darren if, for him to jump in at any, any point in time as well as he goes about uh, his business, uh, working on uh, the horses uh, that he has on his books, uh, he comes across this particular problem quite often. Uh, but the, the one thing that's up at the top of the list is, is nutrition and diet. And one of the problems that we have that's going on in this country and other parts of the world is this obesity. We have about 50% of our horse population, number one, that's, that's overweight. Uh, and, and this leads to other specific health issues uh, within the horse. And, and those are listed under the uh, metabolic conditions there. Uh, metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, Cushing's. And, and all of those are contributing factors to this laminitic process. Uh, Another contributing factor to, to laminitis is if the horse is receiving to it excessive amounts of carbohydrates. So we need to be mindful of what the horse is actually eating on a daily basis itself. Uh, and then we have a host of other health issues at the very bottom of this slide, and there are many. Uh, that involves colic, diarrhea, pneumonia, a bacterial infection, blood poisoning. Uh, if a mare doesn't pass the placenta after she has foaled, then that's a, a likely case of laminitis there. Uh, excessive stress to the horse can be a cause. And we can actually have a parasite overload that would contribute to a laminitic bout as well. And then when we get to the mechanical side, I'll ask Darren to jump in right here and to give us some insight on this. Yes, Mr. Barker, in, in, in addition to the array of health and or metabolic issues that you've, you've certainly discussed uh, prior to this, uh, the mechanical side, uh, one of the things that uh, they kind of go hand in hand, as you see listed, is concussion and the trauma to the lamina. Now, when we talk about concussion, quite often that, that's going to be uh, displayed by a horse that's working on the tarmac or working on a uh, hard surfaces, road horses that are being uh, potentially uh, ridden or driven where they, uh, the, the foot actually, uh, especially in the summertime, can develop a large amount of heat with inside of it um, and, and essentially cause inflammation or, or discomfort in that area in the lamellar beds uh, due to the concussion. Uh, the horse is, is a master of, of actually doing away with concussion in its feet that is results from ground reaction forces as it travels across uh, ground, uh, grass, tarmac. However, uh, it can be overcome and uh, essentially that lamina will be become inflamed and you will find yourself with a, a type of laminitis that could pro pro progress from simple 
inflammation of the lamina to something we've discussed earlier in the slides where you actually have movement uh, within in the distal phalanx. Uh, fractures, uh, sometimes we'll see those in, in young horses, uh, not so much leading to laminitis, but you'll see where maybe the mom steps on the, the foal and uh, can fracture the coffin bone down low. Uh, or affected joints uh, often may see those with a puncture uh, with a foreign object such as a, a nail or something that uh, actually goes into the horse deep enough to infect joints and what have you. The, the fractures are going to be something that it would be uh, from a pretty significant trauma uh, that the horse may potentially uh, succumb to in his daily work. Thank you, Darren. And as we take a look at the next slide here, we were talking about excessive carbohydrates. Uh, this is just a simple graph of what can happen if that horse is receiving uh, excess carbs in the diet. Uh, basically, we have an overload in the small intestine itself. Uh, this forces those carbs back into the hind gut really before they're really ready to enter at that point there. Uh, and, and what what happens is that we have an imbalance, especially as far as the pH. Uh, this creates a toxic situation there, uh, and and then this is picked up by the in, into the bloodstream itself, and then this is the starting point of a laminatic bout that was created from excessive carbs uh, in the diet itself. As we take a look at the next slide here, uh, mismanagement due to overfeeding idle horses causes 70 to 80 percent of laminite, laminitic cases. So let's keep that in mind there. These horses that uh, are very limited in exercise and work that tend to be overweight, uh, then sometimes uh, too much is, is not good for that horse itself. And I'll ask uh, Mr. Darren here to come back in and give his insight here. Sure, we, uh, this is a very interesting slide in the sense that, that we know that, that founder is the second leading cause of death in horses. And to me, that slide is just uh, absolutely um, uh, something that we would need to take note to. Um, and the reason that we, we need to take note to this is because, you know, this, this particular condition in, in horses is not anything that's new. Um, the, this dates back um, between one to 3.5 million years. This is not something that is new to the horse. However, there has been extensive research that has gone on through our veterinarian and research community, especially there at Life Data Labs in Cherokee, Alabama, trying to figure out how we can help these horses. So I would just like that, that slide to kind of resonate with you as we move through this webinar. Some of the, the breeds, uh, should you own any of these breeds, uh, you're gonna uh, have higher risk. Uh, those breeds are essentially draft horses, as you see listed, Morgan horses, of course, your small ponies, and then your miniature horses, as well as your miniature donkeys. And I like to think of this in a way that, that's, that's been helpful in the sense that the horses that, that seem to, to be, have higher risk are horses that are, that are really, really good at utilizing their foodstuffs. And uh, what I mean by that is that they can, uh, they're often referred to as easy keepers, they're often referred to as horses that uh, don't need a significant amount um, of feed, essentially. However, uh, they can do their jobs very well. So when you, when you think about those breeds, uh, those are horses that, that, again, will function, have a very, uh, a very high MP, MP, MPG, if you will, if you refer to them as automobiles, where uh, we'll, we'll call them M, uh, MGBs, where, you know, miles per bale, and they can actually uh, do a lot of work uh, with with a bale of hay, where, for example, go a lot of miles, where some, some breeds, as we refer to them, cannot do that. So those are breeds to keep in mind uh, when you're, if you happen to own some of those, or really keep a watchful eye out. Let's take a look, look at our, our next phase of, uh, this, this particular webinar, and, and that's prevention. 
And of course, we know that it's uh, much easier to prevent the problem to have to deal with the problem firsthand there. And one of the one of the first things that is critical is what we're feeding the horse. And we need to make sure, number one, that the horse is receiving a balanced diet. We need to make sure that the horse is uh, grazing what it safely can without uh, overloading itself with carbs and sugars that are especially going to be found in cool season grasses. Another thing that we can do is we can add to that diet uh, supplementation in the form of a hoof supplement, which has a specific purpose and that it's going to benefit the entire horse and especially the foot of the horse and that it's going to improve uh, the quality of the foot internally. Uh, and then we need to be mindful of uh, the farrier work that's being done, uh, keeping a balanced foot uh, in a timely fashion as well. And as we go to the next slide here, and we specifically get into the diet of the horse, we need to number one, uh, feed in accordance to what that horse is doing as far as its workload. Each horse is an individual in itself and, and what's needed for one horse may not be needed for an, another horse as far as calories and energy in particular. The nutrients are going to remain the same, but the, the, the caloric needs will differ depending on workload itself. Uh, and, and we're going to adjust the uh, body condition score of the horse by the amount of calories that we're providing that particular horse. Uh, we want to feed little and we want to do that often if possible. Uh, there are some things that we want to avoid and that would be cereal mixes. We want to avoid sugar uh, that's derived uh, especially from molasses. Uh, another thing that we need to be mindful is when we're feeding the horse is, is the, the speed uh, that the horse is actually eating. And a lot of these overweight horses that tend to have metabolic problems are going to be quick eaters. They want to gobble down uh, that food in, in a rather quick manner. Uh, another thing that is very critical, especially in the spring of the year and also in late fall of the year, if those horses are on cool season grasses, is fructans or fructose or these sugars that's going to be found in these cool season grasses there. And so we need to be very mindful at the time of the day that we're actually letting those horses graze as well. Uh, if we're using shavings, uh, we want to avoid those that would uh, have black walnut in those because that is very toxic to a horse in itself. If we change the diet of the horse, we need to do that on a gradual, slow basis. And every horse would benefit from a little exercise, if at all possible, and the horse is actually physically able to do that. And as we talk about grasses, and, and in particular, cool season grasses such as fescue, ryegrass, bluegrass, and we could even throw clover into that, uh, we need to be very mindful of the time of the day, number one, that we're allowing those horses to graze, especially if they are subject to laminitis. And we found that very early morning to about mid-morning or midday is the best time to do that, simply because the level of the fructans in that grass is going to be the lowest at that point in time as well. Of course, any time we have an, an over-fertilized forage, then we're gonna have excessive forage uh, for that horse to consume there. Uh, another time frame that can cause a problem with cool season grasses if, is if that, uh, that grass is severely stressed, uh, either from a freeze or a frost or severe drought. Uh, and at that point in time, we're gonna have higher levels of fructans uh, that can, be, uh, can create a problem to the horse itself. 
And anytime we're going to introduce a horse to a new forage for the first time, we need to, to need to limit that uh, at, at the get go. And another thing that, uh, as far as the diet, would be the incorporation of a hoof supplement itself. Uh, and, and what this hoof supplement is going to do, it's going to improve the internal aspect of the foot. Uh, and it's going to help improve the lamina, the attachment mechanism of the capsule to the bone itself. And it also can help uh, from progressing from a, just a, a laminitic stage to a severe founder. And as we continue to talk about uh, prevention and supplementation, uh, I'll ask Darren to join me as well in this conversation here. Uh, of course, one of the products that Life Data Labs uh, has been producing for almost 40 years is a product called Farragus Formula. Uh, its intended purpose, number one, is to promote hook quality, uh, but it's also going to improve all the dermal tissue in the horse itself. So. Uh, it's going to improve skin, hair coat, hair condition, but most importantly, it's going to internally regrow the foot. Uh, and that's going to help us with a, with a laminate, laminatic bout, if, if that's our case. Uh, and I'll ask Darren from a farrier standpoint, as far as what, what he likes to see, uh, as far as the foot capsule itself. Yes, Mr. Barker, it is, it is absolutely uh, something that I highly recommend uh, for any horse. However, a horse that is suffering from a laminated condition, uh, we need uh, we need the proper nutrients. The key word being proper and balanced nutrients going into this horse to help me uh, myself and and the others working on this horse uh, to grow good dermal tissue. Uh, as we look at those uh, bullet points on this particular slide, uh, for me in summary. What that says is it's good, grows good dermal tissue. And again, uh, you've emphasized that, the wall, the sole, the frog, uh, and the internal components of the foot as well. And we need that. I, I view double strength barriers formula. Uh, for me, I view that as an assistant, uh, an additional team member in the treatment, uh, treatment team for a laminitic horse. It's one that works on, on from the inside of the horse and, and helps me uh, as a farrier uh, on the ground to give me uh, a good strong foot and to help bring uh, relief and comfort uh, to the horse as well. And one of the things that that I, that I find so reassuring as a professional uh, in thinking of nutrition is farrier's formula is safe and it's safe for horses with acute laminitis. It's safe with horses that have had history of laminitis uh, or obese horses, metabolic conditions, uh, pregnant mares, foals, and growing horses. So for me, uh, the list of, of being a safe uh, hoof supplementation for the horse uh, is just is actually very comforting. So essentially, as we feed farriers formally, it's going to uh, thicken the hoof wall, but it's also going to uh, thicken another aspect of the foot itself. And, and I'll let you talk about that there. Absolutely. The, when we think about the sole, uh, for those listening, we think about the same as the sole in your shoe. Uh, the sole is the orthotic support, uh, a portion of the orthotic support or the orthotic support, if you will, in uh, the bottom of the horse's foot. Uh, it goes up underneath the coffin bone, grows from the, the, the actual solar surface of the coffin bone downward and provides this horse comfort. And if, if we're talking about laminitis and, and or the potential movement of that coffin bone, uh, you'll have some impingement there and you want to ensure that that horse is getting good nutrition to the sole and we want that sole to thicken as quickly as possible uh, to give that horse comfort from the ground reaction forces it's going to be subjected to. And as we take a look at the next slide here, of course, long-term feeding uh, of farrier's formula uh, is going to completely regrow the foot over a period of time. And of course, the important thing with a laminated course is it's going to strengthen the bond, uh, the lamina that's going to uh, 
secure that hook wall and the sole of the foot uh, to the coffin bone itself. And as we get into the next slide, uh, Darren, uh, I'll let you talk about this as well. Sure. This this particular slide here illustrates uh, things that we're gonna we're gonna do, if you will, um, as we go forward uh, in in the event. For for example, um, these are not going to be, I would say, you know, acute aspects that a farrier or veterinarian team are working on. Uh, they do apply, and and they're part of that. However, these are going to be things that we're going to do, uh, as you noticed here, for prevention. These are things that that are going to be you know, everyday housekeeping for your horses. Uh, and essentially, so when you think about that, you know, our job as a farrier is going to be to for stress reduction. As this, this horse begins to uh, return to locomotion, we're going to ensure that that locomotion and that ease, that the way of going is as easy as possible for the horse. Um, we know that the, the hoof capsule is a visuoelastic structure. We know that that structure uh, can be subjected to deformation. So we know that that structure could will begin to move and or have change uh, should there have been a, a bit more of an extreme case with the movement of the coffin bone. So it's our job to, to keep that hoof capsule tidy and to keep that, that, that capsule in, in the position to where you have optimal locomotion uh, for the horse. And essentially when the horse is standing, we want to think about stance tension and make sure that stance tension is optimal for the horse that's suffering this condition. And, and as you see in the bottom, to, to obtain that, uh, our, our work should be done every four uh, to six weeks. Earlier normally the better, that way the horse is not subjected to a significant amount of change. Yeah, and when does this start, Darren? Well, you know, we, we, we think about that, it essentially is gonna, gonna start, you know, right, right from birth, um, when, when the horse, um, is born, you know, we, we're going to be faced uh, essentially with good stewards of these these wonderful creatures that we have in our lives. And and from the time the, the horse comes into the world, you know, if we know that this is the second leading cause of death in these animals, then it should be on our mind the minute that foal hits the ground. And that's going to be from the wonderful work that Life Data is doing with nutrition and providing information to horse owners uh, throughout the equine community. Our veterinarians and and those that that are equine health providers that are giving us this information, and and we know early intervention is something that that was an effective tool should we should be subjected to that. So uh, we want to do in my mind we want to be looking at that horse the minute that the that beautiful foal hits the ground. And as let's go to the next section of our webinar, and, and that deals with uh, treatment. You know, what what can we do? Uh, I would suggest number one that it's it's going to take a team effort, uh, and that team is going to be made up of the the veterinarian. It's going to be made up of the farrier and the horse owner plays a big role in treating a laminated horse. Uh, of course, the farrier will come in and do his or her thing, the vet's going to do that, and then the horse owner is going to be left there on a daily basis uh, to manage, to take care, to keep this horse as comfortable as possible uh, during this bout of laminitis. And then on the onset of laminitis, uh, then we certainly, we want to consult with a veterinarian at that point in time. Of course, something simple that the horse owner can do uh, in the meantime is, is we can keep the feet cool. That is either with cool water, we can ice at that point in time. Uh, and if we have an acute case, we certainly need to treat that as an emergency because we want to jump on that as quickly as possible. Uh, we need to determine what caused the problem. And if we can do that, we will remove that problem so that it will help uh, stop the progressive damage that's being done and help prevent future uh, future problems uh, with this condition itself. And, and as we consider the team effort here, Darren, what's, 
go over these different roles for us. Sure, absolutely. It is it is absolutely critical that you have a team of veterinarian and farrier uh, and care providers that are associated with this horse that work seamlessly together. I will go over uh, individually their roles to include the horse owner's role as well. However, it's it's very important uh, this this particular condition changes hour by hour, and it's very very important that the team is able to to communicate. And that team again is the horse owner, the veterinarian, the farrier, the grooms, anyone that's associated with this horse uh, during this particular this acute time frame, especially. So the veterinarian, uh, obviously, we know from from what was spoken in the previous slide, this is in a true emergency. Acute cases are, are a true equine emergency, uh, and that would certainly be defined by your veterinarian and your farrier as well. And what we what the veterinarian is going to do, the veterinarian's role is going to to work to reduce the swelling that is occurring inside the horse. Uh, they'll also be responsible uh, working together with the, the farrier to take radiographs to look inside to see what type of progression they are they are looking at. For example, you might shoot uh, radiographs on day one, and then you're going to reshoot them on uh, week two, if you will, and or week one, and you'll actually could potentially see changes there. So they're going to give us a diagnostic insight into what it's inside the hoof capsule and help us there. Uh, again, they're going to be responsible for prescribing any kind of medication in the hopes that um, we could reduce the uh, potential swelling inside the hoof capsule that's causing this horse significant damage. Um, when we think about that, it's very, um, it can be described as a hoof vault, uh, as a closed, uh, as a closed vault, if you will, that that is that the pressure cannot get out. That's why you feel those bounding digital pulses because of the compartment compartment syndrome. Uh, and we know that when necrosis, pressure necrosis begins, uh, we're going to have oxygen starvation uh, and the lack of nutrients uh, destroy the tissue between the hoof wall and the coffin bone. And the veterinarian will be involved in working with the owner um, to help them with medication. And, and they'll have the lead role in developing a plan to, to work forward with this horse. And one of the things you, you spoke about, the icing, uh, would certainly be, be part of the treatment plan that would go forward. And then the veterinarian and farrier would then devise some sort of modality uh, of shoeing from then. And quite and often, what, yes, sir, and quite often what you'll see, uh, the farrier's role will be the mechanic. And the farrier, when the farrier goes forward with that, um, the veterinarian farrier will look at the radiographs and they'll decide which type of modality of shoeing uh, and or maintenance would be, uh, would be best for the horse. Um, those will, can range anything from maintaining the horse in a barefoot state and using some sort of boot for protection. Uh, they can, it can be a uh, application of, for example, a heart bar shoe that would give the horse support in the rear aspect of the foot to help with the, support the frog. But what we're really concerned with is making sure that we can very quickly get recirculation back into the, the hoof and the hoof capsule, help the hoof in that regard. Um, there's some very large arterial supplies in there, one being the terminal arch artery, another one being the circumflex artery, and then a huge venous plexus that's under the solar region of the foot. Uh, so so there, there's a lot of vascular supply that needs to be looked after. Uh, we as farriers are going to be very conscientious not to put any uh, should we nail the shoe on, we're going to work to the back of the foot and not put nails to the front. Uh, if the horse is in some extreme pain, we'll, we'll look for modern materials, i.e. our glues and, and, and sort of some sort of gluing modality of shoes to help us there. Uh, there's several different types that are available uh, for tools for the farrier and veterinarian. So that's what the farrier, again, is going to be the mechanic and, and work uh, to help the horse in that regard. The horse owner's role, obviously uh, quite often the biggest in the sense that they're going to be responsible for this horse uh, on a daily basis. And uh, we talked about soaking the feet. Uh, if we think back, obviously this is something that the horses would do themselves if they were left to their own. To their own. You'll, you'll see and read in, about horses that go stand in creeks uh, or rivers and often referred to as having hot feet. Um, so the soaking, uh, something you can do to enhance that. 
is you can mix uh, ice cream salt in uh, and that will help you as well, help make the water a bit cooler. Um, and as we go uh, also with the, the shavings, we're gonna ensure that the stalls are bedded properly and uh, certainly nutritional support that would work uh, also be something you would consult with your veterinarian about adjusting the horse's diet most likely uh, would remove all of his, his or her grain, uh, continue to offer free choice water, and, uh, and make sure that you limit your hay consumption to, to a hay that the, the veterinarian feels is, is, can, is okay for the horse to eat. And as we get to the uh, final section of uh, this webinar this morning, uh, let, let's take a look at recovery here. And as we take a look at this particular slide here, if we have a horse that has a problem with laminitis, it's laminitic, uh, then we, we have found here that most equine diets are deficient of certain nutrients that that horse needs for the recovery to get beyond this problem and this condition. Uh, and the way that we have come to this conclusion is that Life Data Labs has always been a research-minded company. And we actually have an in-house lab uh, that's in operation as we speak. Uh, and Dr. Frank Gravely and Dr. Scott Gravely uh, have taken the initiative through blood testing uh, to determine, number one, as far as nutritional needs. And, and one of the groups of problematic horses that they worked with was the laminated, the foundered horse here. And through this blood work, they determined uh, that there were certain uh, nutrients as far as minerals that were deficient. There were certain nutrients that were toxic. Uh, more than what they, the horse needed itself. And, and so uh, this gives us a true picture of what the horse is, is doing nutritionally, and especially during this laminitic bout itself. And, and as we talk about these new different nutrients that that horse needs during this stage and to help regrow the foot internally, uh, then some of these that we will quickly mention is lecithin, tyrosine, and iodine, and, and all of these are going to support the liver of the horse. The amino acids are extremely important in rebuilding the hoof itself. Uh, also, the essential fatty acids come into play to help build cell membranes, to help build the wall. Of course, we also have vitamin A and biotin, and then some of the uh, minerals uh, that we need to take a look at are calcium, copper, and, and zinc as well. And of course, that leads us to the product that we've already mentioned, which is Farius formula. And Farius formula contains a lot of these nutrients that that horse needs to regrow the foot, to promote hoof growth, to help combat against uh, a laminitic process there. Uh, various formula is a very safe supplement to feed to pregnant mares, to foals as soon as they get uh, big enough to start eating and nibbling a, a little bit. And we've actually, through this blood work that Life Data Labs has done, and on this particular group of laminitic horses, we found that there has been excesses and then there's deficiencies of certain nutrients that that horse needs to fully recover. And one of those things is zinc. And this group of laminated horses that have been tested, they show low levels of zinc within the blood itself. We have excesses of magnesium phosphorus and selenium as well in this group of horses uh, and some other critical uh, nutrients, copper, vitamin C, uh, and some of these we've already mentioned as well, thiamine, DL-methionine, uh, yucca extract, and then your amino acids. And, and what this research has led to is the creation uh, of a new supplement, uh, which is our, our lamina formula. Uh, and this is a companion product that's to be fed in conjunction with Farrier's formula. 
And what these two products are going to do together is they're going to meet all the nutritional needs of the laminated horse and the foundered horse. Of course, the purpose of the, 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 the lamini formula, uh, along with various formula, is to help reduce inflammation. It's going to help maintain blood flow to the hoof capsule itself. It's going to help uh, alleviate future bouts of laminitis to reduce the incidence of laminitis, particularly if we have a horse that has a chronic problem. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, let me uh, reiterate once again, this is a companion product to be fed with Farrier's formula. Now let's keep in mind that these two supplements cannot do what we see on the screen here. They cannot control excess carbs that's been given to the horse. Uh, these supplements cannot control overconsumption of concentrates or feedstuffs or grain. And these supplements uh, will not control any type of a, a mechanical problem as far as laminitis itself. And that brings us uh, to the end of our uh, webinar. And we want to thank you for joining us today. And, uh, and thank you, Darren, for joining us today as well. And I'll turn it back over to Corbin now. All right, thank you, Mike. Um, well, I know a lot of you guys have been looking forward to this giveaway that we're gonna have. Um, so as you guys have all logged in, I've been uh, assigning everybody numbers. And I'm going to draw a random number, and uh, and that person will win a, a bag of the Farish Formula Double Strength and a bag of the new Life Data Lamina Formula. Um, okay, so everybody, uh, I guess, help me congratulate uh, Susan Coleman. Uh, you are the winner of our uh, giveaway. You can email C Service at LifeDataLabs.com, and the subject on the subject line, just put a webinar winner. Uh, give us your uh, your name and your your shipping information, and uh, and we will work with you on on getting your prize to you. Um, and now in the, in the meantime, we've got several questions uh, that have come in as the webinar has, uh, has progressed. That I'm going to uh, ask uh, Mike and Darren here, uh, and we're going to answer them to the best of our abilities. Uh, in the meantime, if you've got any questions, please feel free to submit them. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see your GoToWebinar uh, drop-down menu. There should be a place for you to submit those questions. Okay, um, let's see. So the first one uh, is from Patty Swan. Uh, she says, how many hours a day should a horse that has access to springtime fescue Bermuda field, um, should, should they feed on that? And it's an easy keeper horse. If it's an easy keeper horse, and that's, uh, that horse is going to be very subject to a bout of laminitis, uh, we would want to take a look at early morning hours to about mid-morning, no later than midday at the most, and then we would want to pull that horse off of that forage at that point in time, because what sunlight is doing, uh, it's, uh, it's creating through the, the photosynthesis, is creating these sugars, the fructans and the fructose uh, during the afternoon hours. And then what the grass is going to do at night is to use those up. So the best time is early morning hours and that's when the fructan levels are the lowest. Okay, um, and then uh, Arlen asked uh, a similar question about, uh, about the pasture. Um, Arlen, if Mike didn't just answer your question, please feel free to, uh, to submit another one and, and let us know if you have any other additional questions um, regarding the pasture. Um, see, this one is from Don Stoller. Um, do you have to continue feeding this product after the horse recovers from laminitis? Uh, it, it depends. And, and if you have a chronic case where the horse is subject uh, to laminitis on a continuous basis, yes, you would need to con continue feeding this. If you have just an acute case, essentially say a one-time deal, then we would need to feed both products for at least, I'm gonna say eight, nine months. And, and at that point in time, we'll, uh, 
our, our hoof should be uh, almost totally regrown at that point in time. Okay. Um, and just to uh, kind of continue with this question, Mike, um, now if that's with the lamina formula, uh, but with the Ferris formula double strength, will, they, will she want to continue? Yes, I would continue the double strength formula, yes. Okay. On, on an acute case, we, we would want to feed the lamina formula at least eight months, and, and then let's continue with the Ferris formula to clarify that, yes. Okay. All right, this is from uh, John Tolley. Uh, and uh, let's see, Darren, I'm going to ask you this one. Uh, does being bare for, uh, barefoot or shod have any adverse effects? I would I assume the question uh, Corbin is asking, does it have any adverse or contributing uh, facts, uh, excuse me, factors that would uh, increase the horse's risk to laminitis? And um, currently, I don't know of any that would... Um, that we would say that the horse that's shod would be have a higher risk factor or a horse that's barefoot has a higher risk factor. I don't, uh, I'm, I'm very sorry, I don't have any um, data that would get, that would allow me to formulate an opinion. Uh, what I would uh, direct that question to, uh, that the, the person may be able to grab up some, uh, some great information would be the book that Dr. Frank Gravely and Dr. Doug Butler co-authored in 2007 entitled Laminitis and Founder, Prevention and Treatment for the Greatest Chances of Success. Uh, and I understand um, uh, Life Data Labs offers that as a free download at the uh, Life Data Labs website. I think there probably could be some uh, very, uh, very good information for that question in there. Uh, you're, you're correct, Darren. Uh, that, uh, that is available as an ebook on our website, uh, lifedatalabs.com. Uh, you should be able to uh, find it under the resources tab. Um, and you can just uh, you'll fill out a little form and then uh, the links to that digital download will be sent to your email address. Okay, uh, next question from uh, Laura Johnson. Um, is there a risk of winter laminitis during cold weather that might restrict blood flow to the hoof? Uh, yes, there would be. Uh, if you keep in mind, cool season grasses are going to be our culprit. And during the winter months and the cooler times of the year, that's when our cool season grasses want to thrive and be lush and be green. And another factor that we haven't pointed out to, temperature has a play as well as far as the amount of fructans that's going to be stored in these cool season grasses. So if it's below 40 degrees at night, then this can cause a problem to grazing these cool season grasses any time during the day. Because uh, with cool temperatures at night below the 40 degree mark, uh, then the grass is not able to utilize the fructans itself. And of course, these are, are, are stored uh, within the stem and within the leaf of the grass itself, yes. Okay, this question is from Susan Dunstan. Um, in regard to symptoms of laminitis, reluctance to walk if a horse is fine on soft surfaces, such as the pasture or in an arena, but reluctant to walk on a hard surface, should the owner automatically think laminitis? Darren, you want to answer that one? Sure, no, not a, no, no problem at all. I, I would certainly say that that should be one of the, uh, that laminitis should be one of the actual diagnostic boxes that, that are being looked at by the team. Uh, that doesn't, that's not in its own right, simply laminitis. Uh, however, the horse uh, is having sensitivity to harder ground. So we would certainly know or think um, that there is, there is some, some sensitivity in the feet. If the horse is transversing from uh, a softer, synthetic arena or grass and then coming in, into a harder surface such as a, a concrete aisleway in the barn and showing reluctance and sensitivity it certainly would be on my list it's not necessarily uh, something that would be a clear indicator more diagnostic work would need to be done okay all right and this one's not a question but this is from uh, annie jenkins 
Uh, she just wants to let, let us know that she truly appreciates our products. Uh, she feeds them to her horse, and she's beginning to start her dog on uh, breeder's formula. Uh, so thank you very much, Annie, and uh, I'm glad that the uh, products are assisting you and helping you and your animals. Let's see. Uh, this is from uh, Vicki, and I hope I say your last name right, uh, Centers. Um, is there a particular grazing muzzle that you prefer? Uh, there's not one in my opinion. Of course, there's many, many, many grazing muzzles out there. Uh, and, and of course, what that's going to do is help uh, uh, limit the amount of grazing and the consumption of these cool season grasses. So, uh, like I say, there's many manufacturers and, and many of those on the market. Okay. Um, and this question is for uh, Richard uh, from Richard Costin. Um, he wants to know uh, what data do you have to support these products? You want to talk a little more about the nutrition program? Yeah, the nutrition program that we have in place here, uh, where we're actually pulling blood from these laminitic and foundered horses. And you actually have the opportunity yourself, if you have a laminitic, a foundered horse, uh, and you would like that horse to become a part of our ongoing research program, uh, we would love to talk to you about that. In fact, we would love to get the blood from your horse there. In fact, you can call us direct, shoot us an email. Uh, at the current time, there are no charges uh, uh, for that analysis, and then your horse becomes a part of this great research program that we're doing on laminitis and founder. Of course, this research goes back 40 years. In fact, it's not something that we've just just started, and as I said earlier, Life Data Labs has always been a research-minded company, and that's how the supplement Ferris formula came about was through extensive research through blood work on horses. Okay, uh, John Tully would like to know: uh, Can we get a copy of the slides, uh, John? When this presentation, uh, this presentation is actually being recorded right now. Uh, so we'll be putting this on YouTube. That way you can uh, that way you can watch it again. Um, so if you have any questions on that, please you can feel free to to call us or to email again the customer service, which is cservice at lifedatalabs.com. Um, and I'll, I'm going to make sure that uh, everybody receives a link of the webinar um, through email, uh, which will probably go out Friday. Okay, uh, this is from Shay Roberts. Uh, can electrolytes help prevent laminitis? Darren, how would you like to answer that question? What do you think? Well, I think the electrolytes and proper hydration of the horse are paramount. I, I don't have the expertise to connect the two uh, personally. Um, so I, again, I, I would have to defer that into the field of the veterinarian uh, potentially could could offer more insight. Again, uh, my apologies there. I uh, would have to refer that back to maybe even uh, their life data, Dr. Scott may be able to help us with that. But uh, I, I don't have the expertise to connect the hydration aspect uh, into the laminitis. I, I do know that, again, laminitis is a secondary effect of the long list that was presented in this webinar. So um, it very likely could uh, be somehow connected. I, I just don't have that ability. I don't either, so to speak, but the, if uh, if the individual will get back with one of our veterinarians here on staff, they would be more than glad to assist them with that question. Mm -hmm. um, what about the need for chromium? I've often hear um, it is often deficient in laminitic courses. I don't know the answer to that one either. And so if you would be glad to get back with Dr. Scott Gravely, he can answer that question specifically for you. Yeah, and any of these questions involving, you know, questions on these nutrients, uh, you know, Dr. Scott Gravely here, uh, he's happy to answer any of your questions that you have. Uh, so you can feel free to contact us and, and we can uh, uh, put you in touch with him and he, and he can explain and, and talk about any of that information. Okay, uh, this is from uh, Morley Marshall. Uh, my horse has very thin soles. Uh, roughly how much thickness can I expect using Ferris Formula Double Strength? Well, over, over a period of time in feeding Ferris Formula, internally, what the product is going to do over a period of time, number one, it's going to thicken and strengthen the hoof wall. 
But the most important thing in your case is actually going to thicken the sole of the foot. And, and we've had many horses that uh, are barefoot, that have been sensitive to a hard surface, that have been put on farrier's formula, and farrier's formula created enough protection there uh, where the horse was sound on the hard surface at that point in time. Now, this certainly won't be an overnight fix, uh, and depending on the breed of the horse, number one, uh, uh, this is a horse that may need to be fed continuous farrier's formula to maintain the sole thickness that you need. Uh, and then, uh, Darren, do you have anything to add on that question? I know you use farrier's formula and recommend that to your uh, uh, customer. So, uh, you know, do you, how much do you usually see when, when your customers start using it? Absolutely. It, it's as Mr. Barker said, it's going to uh, to enhance the horse's ability to grow protection, and the sole is part of that protection uh, in the sense that it is it is a uh, the sole itself by definition is an intermittent weight bearing structure on the bottom of the horse's foot, and will uh, will be affected by the ground reaction forces that is that's occurring. So um, we do want that to thicken up, and feeding it properly. Uh, and balanced will essentially uh, do that for the horse uh, to have a measurable amount. Uh, again, a super great question and be interesting to uh, to do if if they um, had the ability to put the horse on farriers, form the double strength, shoot a radio, take a radiograph or the a lateral radiograph, measure sole depth, feed the horse. Uh, I'd be delighted to 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 hear how that goes. Uh, it, for me, uh, I I see a uh, an increase um and protection for the horse so it would be great to to see how that worked for the for that particular horse center great question thank you okay um <clears throat> another question uh from brian uh how does lamina formula differ from farrier's formula and barn bag uh, i guess barn bag which says it's for insulin resistance horses and horses uh, with metabolic syndrome the difference between the lamina formula and various formula is that the lamina formula has uh, some additional nutrients added to that's going to be in it uh, that's going to offset the deficiencies that were determined through the blood work that was done on this group of laminitic horses. There are also additional nutrients that are going to offset the uh, if you want to call it the toxicity level of certain nutrients. In other words, a lot of times we can add a certain uh, nutrient to the diet of the horse where we have an excess of another and it will balance those out for you. Okay. Okay. Um, and then uh, how long should lamina formula be fed since it's a 30 day supply? and Ferris formula double strength is a 60-day supply uh, was the best feeding regimen. On a chronic case, we would want to continuously feed both products. On an acute case, we would want to feed the lamina formula at least eight to nine months along with Ferris formula, and then we can do away with the lamina formula and just continue on Ferris formula itself. I think it's also important to uh, to point out that you know we have the original Farish formula, uh, which is a 30-day supply. So you know one bag of Farish formula and one bag of the Lamina formula would last you the 30 days. Where Farish formula double strength is a 60-day supply, so you'd actually need two bags of That's that right. Lamina formula and one bag of the double strength, and that supply would last you uh, the full 60 days. Uh, okay, this one's from uh, Carolyn uh, Warner, and uh, again, not another question, but just a uh, thank you for a great seminar. Um, always good to hear from Mike. Thank you for making a great product, and my horse greatly thanks you as well, as last year was a very rough year with reoccurring abscesses and about of laminitis. Uh, well, thank you, Carolyn, and thank you for attending the webinar. Um, another one from Ruth uh from Ruth, thanks for a wonderful webinar. I have been using the Ferris Formula uh, DS with joint for nine months and just added the barn bag formula. Thank you, and thank you, Ruth. 
Uh, let's see, Shay Roberts would like to know why do high levels of magnesium occur in laminitis horses? Why do they? Mm -hmm. uh, I specifically can't ask that question, uh, but what the high levels of magnesium will do in a laminitic horse is that they act as a vasodilator as far as the vessel itself. And what we suggest and recommend is to use a vasorestrictor in itself. So, uh, and if you will get with Dr. Scott Gravely, he can specifically answer that question for you. All right, thank you, Mike. Okay, uh, Ruth's back again with uh, will this webinar be available for me to share with a friend? Uh, yes, Ruth, that YouTube video that we will put up uh, you can share that with uh, with friends. You can share it on Facebook. Uh, share it wherever you where you like. The the more people you share it with, uh, the the more we appreciate it. So uh, please feel free to send that to anybody and everybody you'd like to. Okay, uh, Susan Dunstan. If a horse is currently on an overall body supplement like Platinum Performance, is it also safe to feed Farrier's formula? Uh, yes, it is. In fact, uh, uh, platinum performance is pretty much a general, uh, unless you're feeding the uh, hoof version of platinum, yes. Okay. This one's from Amanda Larder. Uh, this is a production comparison question. I had been using the double strength, but switched to the joint to eliminate a different supplement my horse was on. I'm wondering if by using the plus joint instead of the plain double con uh, double strength, have I decreased the hoof protection strengthening? Absolutely not. You're still getting the same protection in the DS plus joint as you are in just feeding double strength by itself. Okay, uh, this is from uh, Morley Marshall. What percentage of feed should be max carbohydrates? That specifically, that's going to be an, an based upon the individual horse itself and whether that's a metabolic course or if we're talking about a normal horse, and, and that would be a good question for Dr. Scott Gravely as well. Let's see. This is from Annie Jenkins. Uh, would strategy healthy edge, ferrous form of double strength, and alfalfa pellets had recently, um, as work picked up, be a good diet. He's on a regular pasture during the day and put up at night with hay. He's definitely looking fantastic and is performing so much stronger now that he has awesome feet. Uh, fame will never come off this supplement. Um, and then also just to point out, uh, we actually put up a testimonial from Fame, from Annie, uh, this week on Facebook. So if you guys want to jump over there and take a look at her testimonial, it's a, it's a really good one. Uh, but Mike, do you want to tackle that question? And what what specifically is the question, Carl? Uh, would strategy healthy edge, Ferris formula double strength, and alfalfa pellets uh, work as a good diet? He's on regular pasture during the day and put up at night with hay. Uh, I, I don't see anything with that. Uh, I would just caution you about uh, the alfalfa pellets. Uh, let's not overdo that with those. So, but everything else looks good. Um, this is from Nancy Corbett. Uh, is it possible after having laminitis and founder for the uh, lamina to reconnect to coffin bone after regrowth of hoof capsule and lamina and proper nutrition and supplements? No new lamina hoof rings on hoof shown, presently recovered from this condition. Thanks to fairies from a double strength, and thank you for a great seminar. So I guess, is it possible after having laminitis and founder for the laminar, laminar to reconnect to the coffin bone? Uh, Darren, would you like to take a stab at that one? Sure, sure. No, we, um, we, are, we have been very fortunate uh, over the years to, uh, and again, I, I might be thought would be depending on the degree of laminitic insult, as we know there are different degrees uh, of laminitis uh, that we have spoken about in this webinar. Uh, however, uh, we have been very fortunate to be able to uh, essentially 
uh, put these horses into uh, a rehab program with the team. And uh, these horses are able to to go forward. And, and again, as you've just heard from Corbin, return to soundness and return to their job. Um, there, there is talk um, that often when the lamina is damaged, that there is scarring uh, inside. And depending on the degree of laminitis, sometimes it's difficult uh, for that scarring to be removed. And um, as we know that the, the actual scar tissue is not as strong as the original tissue. So there are some, some complications uh, that we have to work with and work along. Again, seamless, seamless team approach between the veterinarian and the farrier to understand each aspect of what, what professional is handling. Uh, but we have been very fortunate to return horses uh, to their jobs. Okay, this one's from uh, Don Stoller. Uh, thank you, I've been feeding the fairies formula for two years now. I feel it saved my gilding from being put down due to a Cushing's laminitis episode. Um, uh, thank you, Don, we really appreciate you using the product. Uh, this is from Debbie Sykes. Uh, when you have a mix of ryegrass, is it best to keep pasture mowed? Is the highest sugar content in the tips of the grass? That's a very good question, uh, Debbie, and, and there are several factors that's involved uh, as I make an attempt to answer this particular question. Under normal conditions, your fructans are stored actually in the stems of the plant, somewhere in the neighborhood of about one to two inches above ground level. Now, if that grass is being stressed, or if we have uh, cool temperatures, frost, freezing, uh, then what that grass is on, what the, the, the grass itself is unable to do is to utilize those sugars during the night as that grass is growing. So we end up with a buildup of fructans, not only in the stems of the plant, but also in the outer leaves of the plant as well. So there, there's many factors involved in answering that particular question there. Okay, um, so we have one question regarding uh, contacting um, Dr. Scott. Um, let me switch this over. Um, again, here, this is Darren Owen right here, some of his information. Again, Darren, we, we thank you for coming on to this um, and for being here. The questions, here's his phone number um, and, and email address if you would like to email Darren or contact Darren with any questions. Um, and then here, uh, right here, you can see this right here is our 1-800 number uh, as along with our website. <clears throat> if you call this 1-800 number, um, of course, we've got the directory where, where they can um, you can choose to go to Dr. Scott's phone. Uh, you can also go to the uh, customer service and, uh, and they can help you as well. And they can direct you and to talk to the right person. Um, let's see, uh, what grass is the safest for an easy keeper? Uh, the safest grass is going to be a warm season grass and you won't have the problem with the, the, the fructans in a warm season grass. And, and there are many warm season grass. One of the most common, depending on where you're located, is, is Bermuda, particularly in the southeast here. Okay. Um, would there be benefits for feeding uh, the new product, lamina, uh, to a chronic laminitis horse? Absolutely. And feed that in conjunction with Ferris formula. Let's see. Uh, this is from David White. Um, I already feed your Ferris formula and just started MSM from a uh, springtime company. Uh, could I be overdoing it with both products? You could be. The problem that arises with feed fair with feeding Ferris formula and MSM is this, David, and, and that uh, MSM is a form of sulfur. Farrier's formula already has the sufficient sulfur uh, that's being derived from the DL-methionine in Farrier's formula. Of course, DL-methionine is simply an amino acid. 
So when we combine the MSM and DL methionine from Ferris Pharma, sometimes we can get too much sulfur in the diet of the horse, which can affect hoof quality. So we need to take a, a serious look at what we're doing there. Okay. Um, and the micro quick, can you give uh, uh, when, uh, when to use various formula double strength versus various formula regular strength? Uh, there, basically, there's two differences in that product. And the difference is going to be the amount that you feed. With original, you're feeding one cup or six ounces per day to a thousand pound horse. With the double strength, you feed half as much. So we're only going to feed a half a cup or three ounces. So that uh, original in the white bag is going to last you one month. The double strength in the green bag is going to last you two months. And the other difference between the two is that the double strength is more economical on a cost per month basis. Okay, uh, so they, uh, Sue Collins, she currently feeds uh, the double strength wants to know that she uh, will she feed the lamina formula at the same time uh, if you have a horse that's uh, suspect uh, and has had a bout with laminitis yes you'd feed both of them at the same time yes okay. um, and then Vicki would like to know can lamina formula be given as a preventative absolutely Okay, and then this is the the last question for the for the webinar. Um, are the short grasses from overgrazing more sugary? Are the short grasses from overgrazing more sugary? I would say yes, simply because where the fructans are going to be stored under normal conditions. Okay. Okay, uh, well, again, I want to thank everybody for coming on to the webinar. We're getting close uh, to an hour now, so we're going to uh, uh, close out. Um, but if you have any additional uh, questions, if, you, if there's anything else um, that you need to know, um, I guess we're a little bit past the hour, aren't we? <laughs> hour and 20 minutes. Um, but if you have any other questions, anything else, please feel free to contact us. Uh, we are happy to talk to you. We are happy to answer any of your questions. Um, so never, ever be shy uh, to contact us. Uh, again, you can follow us on Facebook. You can follow us on Instagram. Um, uh, you can subscribe to us on YouTube, and this will be available. Uh, thank you again, and I want to thank Darren again uh, for coming on. Darren, we really appreciate you having you today. Well, thank you, Corbin, and thank you, Mr. Barker, for the opportunity. Uh, and most importantly, thank the horse owners that have have, uh, have been with us today. It's been quite a pleasure, and I, I wish everyone well and, and hope to see you along the way. Thank you very much, Darren. And, and if we didn't fully answer your questions today, if you will get back with us, it would we would be delighted to help you in any way that we can. All right. Thank you, guys, and have a wonderful week.